today, I want to draw a line in the sand and show you that we will be a fool one way or the other. And I want to challenge you to confront your own, your own life with whose fool will you be. Let's look at Mark chapter, or I'm sorry, yes, Mark chapter 15. Uh, my Bible automatically opened to Ephesians. Uh, isn't that funny? I've uh, been preaching through there. Mark chapter 15, and follow along with me if I, as I read through 42 through 47. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have died already. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. I want to pause right there. I'll read verses 1 through 8 and 6 of chapter 16 toward the end. But this is the reality that we deal with today, that Jesus died and that he was raised from the dead. I want to show you out of this passage today three, three truths that we can walk away with. Uh, first off, the reality of Jesus' death. And then I want us to examine the reason for his death and then the response to his death, if you will. So first... The reality of Jesus' death. You know, some people deny that Jesus ever really died. Some people would go so far as to say that he ever really lived at all, that he was not really a historical figure. But I would pose to you that there's more evidence, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, there's more evidence for the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ than most of the people that we study and know about in American history or in world history itself. There's been more written about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus than virtually anybody. But yet there are theories that say Jesus never really died, that in fact maybe he just swooned. And the word swoon is not a word that you would hear uh, every single day. It's a word that comes up usually around the resurrection. And many people say Jesus merely swooned, which means that he endured the arrest, he endured the beating, he was, he was nailed to the cross, he hung there for six hours, he died this gruesome death, he was placed into the tomb, and then when he got into the tomb, that he really wasn't dead he was just unconscious, that he had just fainted from this emotional, taxing experience that he had just had. And when they placed him into the tomb, that the cool, damp air in the tomb actually caused him to revive, and that when he was revived, he unwrapped himself from the, the grave clothes, and he rolled the stone back himself. He overcame the guards that were guarding this tomb, and he just walked away. You can see how implausible this theory really is. This swoon theory, yet some will claim to it that he never really died. He, he merely swooned. Perhaps say that it was someone else on the cross. It wasn't really Jesus himself. But there's multiple people. There are multiple eyewitness accounts that it was indeed Jesus and that he really was there and he really did die. You see, the reality for us is our culture, an, an unbelieving culture today, and if you are an unbeliever here, I welcome you here today, and I'm so glad that you are here, but for many, the, the idea that Jesus died and was raised is an unbelievable claim. And perhaps our culture treats the death of Jesus like they treat the death of Elvis. They would assume that he didn't really die, that he's somewhere else. They claim that Elvis is working at a truck stop in Arizona somewhere. Or they treat the death of Jesus like 9-11, that it was an inside job from our, for, you know, on behalf of our government. Or they treat the death of Jesus like landing on the moon, and they say, we never got there. Or they treat the death of Jesus like the earth's not really round, it's flat. And this is the reality in, in which we live. I want to point, to you, point out to you today some ways that we see in our passage today that, that Jesus really did die. 
There are some common methods used even today to, to confirm death in our experience. One of those is, is when someone calls time of death. We've all seen enough medical shows that you know that there's somewhere in some operating room, someone dies on a table, and there's someone who calls time of death. And it is this, there's this significant moment where this is the moment where this person is pronounced dead. Life has ceased in this person. A second method used today is professional confirmation. Perhaps in our experience, this would be someone like a coroner. When a body is found somewhere it, it, out in our, in our town or somewhere, a coroner who is an elected official will show up at that place and he will confirm, yes, that this person is indeed dead. And they'll turn the body over then to the different um, uh, facilities at that point. And there is a third way that we confirm death in our culture, and that is a funeral. And there is indeed a funeral in this as well. Perhaps you and I have experienced a funeral more than we've experienced the first two, but we all know the seeming finality that is there at a funeral. We understand that at that moment, that person is indeed dead. All three of these are present in this passage. In chapter 15 of Mark, verse 42, says, When evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. This is the time of death being called on Jesus. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 through 23, it, it, that is, uh, it there reveals to us that Jewish law required that a crucified body be buried on the same day that it was crucified. And since this was the day before the Sabbath, they had to hurry. They had to get with it. They had to, if they were going to bury him, they needed to get with it. And, and this would have, uh, since the Jewish day ended at 6 p.m., it points to the fact that probably this was shortly before 6 p.m. on the day before the Sabbath, which would have been Friday. It was a time of death. There's also in our passage a professional confirmation by the soldiers. These, these men were experts on death. From John, we, we learned that the soldiers, in order to hasten the process, they came to break Jesus' legs, but they found him already dead, and so they did not break his bones. And the reason they would break their legs is because crucifixion was more, less, less a, a death of the, the agony of the nails and more death of suffocation. As a, as a person was there on the cross, hanging on that cross, their body would, would droop, and it would cause their rib cage to close up around their, their lungs, and they would use their legs underneath them to, to push up on the, the nails through their feet or, or however they were affixed to take in a deep breath before they would sag again. And so to expedite death, they would break their legs so they could no longer push up on their feet. And these experts in death came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, so there was no need to break his legs. But just to make sure, one of the soldiers, we are told, takes a spear and places it skillfully on the side of Jesus and pierces his heart, and we're told that out of it flowed something like blood and water. And what can actually happen here is under extreme duress, the heart itself can actually rupture, it can actually explode, and, and it will inside, it will cause this, the, the pericardium surrounding the heart to fill with this blood as well as this lymphatic fluid. And that's what came out of him. And they knew at this point that he was indeed dead. I want you to notice how many times Mark draws attention to the fact that Jesus is indeed dead. In verse 43, Joseph asked Pilate for the body. In verse 44, Pilate surprised. Uh, he was surprised that he, he should have already died. In verse 44, he asked the centurion if he was already dead. In verse 45, the centurion confirmed that he was dead. In verse 45, Pilate granted Joseph the corpse. We are told here not just from those who were Jesus' followers that he died, but we are told by those who are outside of this movement of following Christ that he was indeed dead. There is also a funeral here. It was a funeral that was attended by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, we're told in John 19.39, and by the two Marys. 
Verses 46 and 47, And Joseph bought a linen shroud, taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. So this funeral may not have been well attended, but it was attended, and it was indeed a funeral to memorialize that Jesus was indeed dead. There's no question Historically, there is no question that Jesus lived and that he actually did die. The question, though, is why? Why did Jesus die? I mean, people die all the time, but why does Jesus die? This thing that started so well, it seems to come to this abrupt end. Is there a reason why Jesus died? And why do Christians refer to Friday before Easter as Good Friday, the day historically that he did die. What makes it good? Well, this takes us into the reason for Jesus' death. Some would say that Jesus died because he was found guilty and executed as a felon. That his teaching was thought to be dangerous and subversive to Jewish religious system and, and to the Roman establishment there in Israel. And therefore, he was a threat, and he, was a, he led this unsuccessful revolt, and he was arrested and crucified for it. He paid the ultimate price. He was a failed leader. The movement that he started went nowhere. Some would say that. But I don't think that's really what happened. In fact, the Bible reveals that that's not what happened, that this indeed, coming to the cross and dying there, was perfectly God's plan from the beginning. Let's work our way backwards. I want to show you some things from the whole of Scripture. You don't have to flip through these things. I mean, you can if you'd like to, but I'm going to kind of run through these. Mark 10, 45, Jesus' own words. He said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Before He ever went into the garden and prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. He already knew that he would give his life as a ransom for many. He's not saying there that I will give my way in acts of kindness. He's saying there I will give my life away, meaning this life that I take, these lungs that breathe, this heart that beats, will cease to function for the sake of many. We go backwards and we go into the, the book of Jonah, that little book that tells the story of this, this Old Testament prophet sent to Nineveh ran from God because he could not stand the thought of going there. He gets on this ship to go away from where God tells him to. He's on this boat, and a storm comes out of nowhere, and it, they find out he's running from God, and so they throw him overboard. And the Bible tells of this giant fish that swallows him, and specifically it tells us that he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And afterwards, the fish then spewed him out into the land of the living again. This is no coincidence. This is a picture of what God had planned from the beginning, that he would send the one who would not be the rebellious prophet, but who would be the perfect prophet who would go to take the good news of the gospel to his people. Moses, in the wilderness, the, the people complained. They murmured against God. God, why? why have you brought us out here? We don't like this food. We don't have enough water. And to punish them, God sends these fiery serpents. It's another way of saying these poisonous snakes. These poisonous snakes come into the midst of them and they bite several of the Israelites and the Bible tells us that many of them died. But God didn't leave them with this curse of poisonous snakes in their midst. Instead, he told Moses, make this bronze serpent and put this bronze serpent up on a pole, lift it high, and if they will look to the bronze serpent, they will live. And it is a foreshadowing, it is a picture that would come of this Jesus who would be the the. the, the the substitute in our place that would be raised on this cross, and if we would look to him, we would indeed live and be saved. Moses and the Passover blood on the doorposts. They've gone through all the plagues, and now this final plague comes, and he says, tonight in the land of Egypt, if you don't let my people go, God's going to send the death angel, and he's going to come through this place, and every firstborn son will die. But to all the Israelites, God made a provision, and he said, slaughter this lamb, and take the blood of the lamb and paint it on the doorpost and the lintel of your home and then go inside. And when the death angel comes, he will pass over and you'll be spared. And Jesus himself became that Passover lamb. 
You go all the way back I mean, if, to, to Abraham and Isaac. God tells Abraham, this promised child that you've waited on, that I promised you, you were going to be the father of a great nation that was going to be a blessing to all nations. Through this, your promised son, I want you to take this promised son who you've had late, late, late in life, and I want you to kill him. I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham is obedient, and he takes Isaac, and he binds him, and he places him on the altar, and he raises the knife to slay his own son at the obedience of God's command. And God stops him there and provides this ram that's caught in a thicket. And he provides this substitute who would die in the place of Isaac. It points forward to what we're talking about today. In fact, if you go all the way back and you go to Genesis chapter 3, Genesis 1 and 2, you know God created the heavens and the earth. He created man and woman and everything that exists. He put everything under their feet. He put them in a beautiful place. He told them, you've got everything you need. You can have everything you want in this place except for this one fruit from this one tree. Don't eat this. If you eat it, you will die. And they chose to rebel and say, we know better than God. And we will make our own decisions. And death was ushered in. And when God comes into the garden in Genesis chapter 3 and he has this conversation with with Adam and Eve and the serpent who deceived them, he said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now that he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel is a direct picture of what would happen when Jesus would go to the cross that Jesus would have nails driven through his hands and through his feet, and this would be the bruise that would come to the feet of Jesus, but that in that, Jesus would deliver a much more devastating blow to this serpent, to Satan himself, and it would be a fatal head wound. He would crush the head of the serpent. You see, the reason for Jesus' death is not because he was just not that great of a leader or things didn't go his way. It's not that this revolt that he tried to lead went south. The reason Jesus died is because God planned for him to. This was not a surprise. All of the evidence points to God's premeditated design and initiation. Isaiah 53, verse 10. I could read to you that whole chapter, but Isaiah 53, verse 10 tells us that it was the will of the Lord. It pleased Him to crush His Son. Jesus was no victim. He came and did exactly what the Father sent him to do. But why? We still haven't answered the question, why? Why would God send his own son on such a death mission? And why would Jesus embrace such a thing? Who would would willingly want to go through what Jesus went through? There are two reasons. The first is love. The reason that Jesus died was for love. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9-10, through 10, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word means that He was sent because our sin had earned us the wrath of God. God was angry with us. This is what caused Adam and Eve to be expelled from the garden. They could no longer walk with God. They had no fellowship with God. They were kicked out of His presence. God was angry with us. And Jesus was sent to pay that price so that that distance between us and God, the wrath that we deserve, He took it on Himself and He has satisfied the wrath of God so that you and I, by faith, are brought to God and God is no longer angry with us. He loved us. You ever stop and think why God loves you? I mean, if you're like me, I know my heart. I know the thoughts I have. 
I know I most of the time don't follow through on what I am supposed to be following through on. Anybody else? Why does He love us? Because He chooses to. This is what we learn by Him choosing Israel. He said, you are not a people that should be loved. You are not a people that should even be thought about. You are smaller than everybody else, but I have set my affection on you in order to show my glory to the world. There is nothing in you or nothing in me that would cause God to love us. There's no skill in you that, that God says, you know what, man, I've got everything on my team except for that, and He's got it, so you know what? Got to have Him. This is not, God doesn't, God doesn't save the world like we play fantasy football. God sees nothing in you that is lovable. He sees nothing in me that deserves love. Everything in me, everything in us is vile, yet He freely chose to love us even though we didn't deserve it. That's the first reason Jesus died. The second reason, though, Jesus died is justice. He couldn't simply look the other way and accept us in our sin. We have committed terrible acts of wickedness against the infinite holiness of God. You may sit there today, and this is not me talking, in a, talking down to you, I'm not, I'm not uh, being condescending to you, but you may be thinking this thought, I don't think I've done anything that bad. I don't think I've done anything that would warrant Him dying in my place. This is a common uh, a rebuttal uh, for, for why. Why should Jesus have died for me? In, in having that logic, you grossly underestimate His holiness. You look at God as though He is just like one of us. And that His standard of holiness, that His obedience, that His, his purity is, is just like the nicest person you've ever met. And you say, you know what? I mean, based on... I mean, if I compare myself with the nicest person I've ever met, no, I'm not like them. But I can tell you what, I, I can find some people that are not nice at all, and I'm not like them either. And so I'm somewhere in the middle, and you say, well... Why would God have to die for me? And what you don't understand is there is absolutely... It's not just that God is nice. It's that He's holy. That there is no evil in Him. None whatsoever. That he is perfectly separate. And when you, even as nice as you are, compare yourself to an infinitely holy God, you fall way short. It's not even just that God doesn't have any evil in Him. It's that He has nothing but righteousness in Him. That He is good in all that He does. And you and I fall short. Those sins he could not overlook. He couldn't just accept us in our sin. Let me ask you a question. What would you think of a judge who simply acquitted guilty offenders? Would you admire that judge for his love? I mean, perhaps if you're the offender, yeah. If you're in the courtroom and the judge says to you, you, you know you did it, you know you're guilty. And you, you can't, I mean, you just know it's coming. The gavel's going to drop and you're going to be pronounced guilty and the sentence will follow. And you hear the gavel drop from the judge and he says to you, not guilty. Look, I understand you did it. But I think I can judge by your motives that you didn't really mean it. And therefore, I'll let you go. Would you admire that judge for his love? If you're the victim, Yes. I mean, if you're, if you're the perpetrator, yes, but what if you're the victim? Would you admire that judge for his love? You'd be outraged in that moment because of what had been taken from you, what you had suffered and endured, and to hear a judge simply just let this person go? You would not admire this judge for his love. You would say it was a travesty. Judge, how can you do this? How can this be? And you say, well, I don't know if I would. Listen, I've seen people watch college basketball and a referee makes a wrong call and people get all upset and lose their minds. There's this cry for justice that is in every human heart. 
And God knows it. He can't simply overlook and accept us in our sin. That's why Jesus died. See, God loved you enough not to give His punishment to you that you deserved. Instead, He gave it to Jesus. And the reason He gave it to Jesus is because He couldn't just overlook your offense. Someone had to be punished. And so He punished His Son in your place. This is what is meant by Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith, so that God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Two reasons why Jesus died, love and justice. Which, which of those do you like more? Can you have one without the other? If God is all love and no justice, then anything goes. And, and chaos ensues. Because it would be impossible to call anything evil. And this is the, promise, the, the premise of, of Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, that simply removes hell from the equation and says there is no such thing as hell. Everybody gets a pass And he becomes like Oprah giving out gifts. You get to go to heaven, and you get to go to heaven, and you get to go to heaven. And this is God for so many. If he's love without justice. If you take away his love and you say, no, 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 he's got to be just. I like the just side of God. If he's all justice and no love, you and I have no hope. Because the reality for all of us is we deserve hell. The conclusion that I would take out of this, that I would would give to you as well, is that we should thank God that He loved us in spite of our sin by sending Jesus to die as our substitute in our place. The third thing I want you to see out of our passage today is the response to Jesus. The response to Jesus... Everyone else, when Jesus was there on the cross and he was, he was dead, it, he'd been pronounced dead, it was confirmed, everyone knew it. The response was everyone else had abandoned him. There was no one to claim his body. And there was a law on the books that, that said that, hey, if no one claims the body, then the criminals will be taken down off the cross and they will simply be thrown into Gehenna. Gehenna was the place of the dead for that reason. It was basically like the the city dump. It was where everyone took their garbage and everything. And and, and the fires there are said to burn all the time. The worms never stop eating because it was just this trash dump. And this is what would, would happen to Jesus. It looked like this was going to happen if no one claims his body. But then one person stepped up. And Joseph of Arimathea comes forward and he says, Can I have the body? And we're told in John chapter 19 that Nicodemus joined him. Both of these men were, were religious men. They were, they, were, they were part of that religious inner circle. And I, would, I, I just can't help but to notice that perhaps Nicodemus gathered strength. Nicodemus, you'll remember, is the one who came to Jesus by night because he didn't want anyone to know. Perhaps in this moment he gathered strength because another brother stepped up. And all of a sudden there's someone else and the two of them go together. And they take Jesus' body. The Bible here tells us that Joseph was courageous, and Joseph was courageous in spite of the cost. That he took courage. The word, the phrase there means to dare. Joseph dared his life by aligning it with Christ. He, He dared to align his life with the crucified Christ. He was daring away everything that meant anything to him at any point in his life. This was a religious man, but religion had only left him wanting. He was, he was still, the Bible here tells us in our passage, he was still looking for the kingdom of God. See, he was religious and he was part of the inner circle, but it still had left him wanting. And perhaps that's you here today. You have come to church all your life. Or perhaps you only come a few times a year. But you're religious and you're coming here today and you think that this today will somehow make you okay with God. And I pray that what you will find is what Joseph of Arimathea found, that religion will only leave you wanting. That what we're doing here today is not about religion. Religion says, what, what, what do I do? What can I do to be made right with God? 
Christianity is not what, what do we do to get right with God. It's what Jesus has done for us. When religion has only left you wanting, and you've come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, we know from John 19 that, that Joseph of Arimathea had become a secret disciple. That even though he was a member of the council, he was following Christ. He was a secret disciple. He really, he'd come to know Jesus is who he claims to be. When religion has only left you wanting and you've come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, then what is reputation? I mean, he was a respected member of the council, it says. What is worldly position? He was a member of this council. What is life itself? Pilate could have found him guilty of being sympathetic to this crucified criminal and said, you're next. This is a very real possibility. When Joseph steps forward and goes and asks for the body, this is a real possibility. He's gambling his life away. He's daring his life away. He dares away respect and position and life, even earthly possessions. The Bible here says that he buys this linen shroud and he places Jesus, the body of Jesus, in his own tomb. You see, Joseph was willing to dare his life away all for the sake of knowing Christ and the fellowship of his suffering. This is what Paul wrote about in Philippians 3 when he said, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. This is what Joseph of Arimathea was doing. Everything I have is worth nothing if I don't know this man. Paul goes on and he says, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. You see, the New Testament is filled with examples just like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. It makes up the, the bulk of the rest of the New Testament. The story of Christianity, the reason that we are here today is because the resurrection made all the difference in the world. There were responses just like this, where men and women were willing to risk it all for this man who was dead on a cross. And would you do this? I mean... History tells us that, that Peter, the one who had said, if everyone else denies you, I won't. I'll be by your side, Jesus. And then he denied him three times before the rooster crowed. History tells us that Peter was crucified upside down because he would not stop talking about the cross and the resurrection. History tells us that Andrew was crucified in a spread eagle position later on. It's where the, the St. Andrew's Cross of Scotland comes from. Philip was martyred in modern day Turkey. Bartholomew was skinned alive and then beheaded. Thomas was speared to death. Matthew was martyred in either Ethiopia or Persia. James the Less was martyred in Egypt. Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot killed in Persia, either crucified or, or, or some other means. Paul was beheaded in Rome. If, if Jesus had only died, these men would be the most foolish men on the planet. 1 Corinthians 15, we looked at it in our Sunday school class this morning. They would be of all men most to be pitied. If Jesus has only died, then this is crazy. Who dies for a lie? But the story does not end at the funeral. And this is good news. In chapter 16, read along with me. Just listen as I read. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us when, over the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. 
And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid Him. But go tell His disciples and Peter that He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see Him just as He told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. And for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. I think what happened to the women there as they get to the tomb and they see that the tomb is empty. It says that Jesus tells them, go and tell your brothers. They were so taken aback by what seemed so foolish. This doesn't happen. People who are dead don't come back to life. And I think these women were so astonished by this, not to mention the fact that here is this man dressed in white in a tomb. It says they're astonished that for a moment they pause. They say nothing to the brothers. If Jesus had only died, then all those who respond in this way, eventually the women go on and they speak, Anyone who responds by following Jesus, if Jesus only died, then it's foolish. But if Mark 16, 1 through 8 is true, and I believe that it is, then it is the most wise thing anyone could ever do. It would be foolishness to not follow him. I mean, we follow all sorts of other people for a whole lot less, don't we? If it's true that Jesus has been raised from the dead, why would you not follow him? Listen to the words of Al Mohler, president of Southern Seminary. He said, every person will be one kind of fool or the other. We are going to be one variety of fool, the fool who rejects the knowledge of God or the other kind of fool who is foolish before the world because of allegiance to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is better to bear the scorn of the world as a fool and to know the wisdom of the cross or to embrace worldly wisdom and be shown to be a fool on the day when every act and deed and thought will be revealed and all things will be made known to all. See, the reality for all of us is that no matter where you fit into the story today, whether you are here and you say it is foolishness, whether you side with Frederick Nietzsche and you say, how pathetic are these people? Or whether you are here and when I say He is risen, it's everything in you not to scream out, He's risen indeed! No matter what side you are on, someone will call you a fool. And I would simply ask you today, whose fool will you be? Let's pray.